Hello and welcome back to my response uh, to Richard, uh, not Rich, Richard, um, I don't know if that's the actual name, Rich Deems, where young earth creationism gets the Bible wrong. So let's look at it. In order to support this dogma, they feel compelled to claim that plants aren't alive and do not die. However, the Bible clearly says that plants are alive and do die. Uh, unfortunately, this is, in effect, not a, a straw man argument. Uh, I don't think it's intended to be a straw man argument, though, because the argument you gave that you tried to counteract was the one that creationists say nefesh chaya is used to refer to the categories of things that they believe didn't die. And since plants ha are not referred to as nefesh, therefore they categorically do not fit into the category of things that they believe don't die before the fall. And therefore your argument that uses pretty much every term except for nefesh doesn't actually hold any water. When forced to choose between their dogma and the Bible, young earth creationists reject the Bible. Does the Bible really say that the universe was created in 4004 BC? Okay, so this is very interesting because this is something that some young earth creationists believe, but I'd say that probably the majority of them are more uh, vague on the exact date because there's many different factors involved in establishing these dates and there's chronological factors of, of various things and these things are going to be discussed by Rich Deem here to some extent but uh, let's get into it farther. Next we're going to look at the age of the earth according to the Oh, video froze? No? Oh, no, just Contrary audio cut. what many Christians believe, the chronology of Archbishop Usher was not just a sequential list of continuous genealogy. Th that is correct. It, it's not. Despite his dating the creation to exactly Sunday, October 23rd, 4004 BC. To which I say, where did he get the information? So, yes. I, I, again, there's many different kinds of young earth creationists. And if you were to ask most of them, did creation happen at that specific time? They would say that would be pretty silly, a pretty silly argument to make because we don't have evidence for a lot of the things that uh, assumptions that go into that. And therefore, it although they would say uh, several thousand years ago, they wouldn't say um, that it would be, let's say, exactly 4004 BC or 4000 BC or something. Many would give that as a rough estimate. Uh, Anno Mundi, for example, that, that uh, dating system actually puts it a little bit after 4000 BC, uh, since it's, uh, I think we're in the sixth millennium of Anno Mundi right now. Um, but uh, there's many different dating methods that people use and methodologies. This is a timeline of Usher's chronology. Biblical genealogies exist only from Adam to Solomon, and there are many provable gaps in some of these ge genealogies. So he emphasizes Adam here at the front and Solomon over here. Um, and by provable gaps, he's looking at, I think he's emphasizing the period of the judges, but what he's actually, well, to be more exact, what he's looking at is the point where the genealogy ends with Joseph and the point where the timeline of the kings begins. And so, of course, there are 
the Exodus has a stated length. Uh, well, not the Exodus. The sojourn in Egypt has a stated length of how long it is in the Bible. So that's not really a gap. Um, you may play around with that a little bit, though. Um, how long they were in the desert. Uh, that's 40 years. So that's not a gap either. Uh, and judges, the, as well as the lifetime of uh, Joshua, there, there are some dates for that. The thing is, somewhere in the middle of judges, um, we aren't told a, a couple of the judges how long they were judges and whether there was a period of rest. So I think that's a part where you could say that there might be some gaps uh, for some period of judges, although generally we, we do have a minimum length for the time period of judges. So that's something that is useful. We, we have enough data for the time lengths given in judges to have a minimum length, but the maximum length is up for debate a little bit. Um, of course, the kings, there's lengths of reigns for all these kings that are given and then uh, there, uh, well, he's actually going to mention that in a moment. Usher used the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, for part of his genealogies to get rid of a 150-year gap found in the Hebrew Old Testament. From Solomon to, to the Babylonian captivity, the chronology depends on a succession. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. A hundred and fifty year gap. All right. I think I, f I found what he's talking about. And this here is, um, it, it's referring to harmonization between Acts 13 and, uh, and the account of judges, um, where, okay, as the decreasing ages depict during this life, this era lifespans continue to shorten until the time of the global deluge and finally reach modern life expectancies. Thus, even this scenario requires a series of miracle births whereby men begot sons at nearly 100 across a span of time when most men were scarcely living that long. A scenario that would include the 450 years as though they were consecutive linear years for the span describing the eight-year servitude to Kushan. Um, again, these are not reasonable values for the begetting of sons when compared to biblical lifespans for that period. Increasing the, near, uh, the length by nearly 150 years would therefore have the highly improbable effect of two distinct lineages begetting sons at an equal age and beyond which men were living. Hence, the 40 years, etc., referred to in Acts 13, 17, 20, uh, must overlap the about 450 years and be subtracted from it, not summed. This Gordian knot is cut by simply seeing that the about 450 years is not referring to the length of period of the judges at all in Acts 13, 17, 22, Instead, it is either a, a parenthetical remark concerning the span of time of this whole thought from the Exodus in 1491 BC, and it's, it's giving some date, uh, the 400 years of affliction by Egypt plus the 40 years in the wilderness and the seven year war until the actual distribution of the land, a parenthetical remark beginning with a covenantal ritual with Abraham, uh, who consummated in his 99th year in Genesis 17 by the changing of his name from Abram and the seal of circumcision. The period ended, uh, and it gives more dates. C is self-explanatory and may well be the actual solution. A and B are markedly different from content. B is actually saying that 450 years all transpired prior to the events recorded in the book of Judges. So again, the four, the... This is based on some harmonization issues that it gives you 150 years. Um, but anyway, let's actually get back on track. 
So, here we go. ...of kings, which are not necessarily complete. The inter and again, the idea that the kings are not necessarily complete, I find very interesting. Because uh, if we're going to assume that, what we're assuming here is, uh, of course, uh, the problem. Well, the problem with assuming that the list of kings isn't complete is the fact that kings are frequently mentioned as being contemporary to each other, and we do have the lengths of the reigns that kings are mentioned. So that means that even if you assume that they missed a couple here and there it still wouldn't really change the length of that time period significantly. Testamental period depends upon Chaldean and Persian histories. Ultimately, Usher determined that there were exactly 4,000 years. And again, uh, when it comes to the final period in, in there, um, there's the the interpretation that is being made is 490 years and that's of course referring to the prophecy of 70 weeks which many interpret as uh coming from the time of the end of the exile uh or, or the rebuilding of the temple or there's a number of dates where people start it because the date that you end up with uh, is is different to the time when either Jesus died or sometime after he died, if, if you assume that uh, the death occurred in the middle of the week or maybe the time Jesus was born. And then there's a gap theory people have about that where you say the seventh week doesn't happen until a long time after, which I think is kind of weird. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's the implication that's being made uh, that you see here that well not not the implication uh, that there's a gap the implication that the 70 weeks is referring from a time period from the end of the exile to the time of jesus um and of course if you look historiographically okay you understand that that does match up in the sense of the time period that that generally would have happened in uh, the rise of Persia, the conquest that Persia made of Babylon. Of course, a lot of ancient dates aren't really set in stone. Um, so then with the historical context, you go back uh, during the kingdom of Israel, uh, the, the late kingdom of Israel, as, as well as the late kingdom of, of Judah, you see... Uh, Assyria is very powerful, and you've got the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and the names of those uh, Assyrian kings are associated with the ones in Assyrian records, and there's histories associated with them, and so sometimes even dates regarding to certain events, and then going back further... Uh, there's the question of when did the exodus occur, when it was the period of judges, and we know that the time of King Solomon would have had to happen after the Bronze Age collapse. The time of David and Solomon would have had to happen after the Bronze Age collapse and after the decline uh, of the new kingdom of Egypt because the kingdom of Egypt, the new kingdom of Egypt had a sphere of influence that included uh, the Levant, which of course cannot happen at the same time as a powerful king uh, is ruling uh, in Israel. So that of course limits the time that you have. But when it actually concerns the genealogy that occurs before that uh, and of course uh, the time of Joseph would have been before the Bronze Age collapse and and when it actually concerns the genealogy that you have coming up to Joseph here what you may notice is that there are numbers and those numbers not only refer to the lengths of time spans of these individuals uh, that, that they lived 
as it is referenced in the Bible, but it also, there's numbers referring to how old they were when they uh, gave birth to the next uh, generation, which is interesting because the implication we get from that is that, uh, assuming those numbers, we can actually follow the numbers down and find the time of Joseph. So, of course, the chronology of, of that means that from Adam to Joseph, so uh, from the time of creation to the time when uh when Egypt was already an established power, uh, an established regional power. Um, so from a time for, of creation to um, the time of Joseph, many date that to the um, second intermediate period. So from those times, we have a list of times, uh, a, a list of uh, years that tell us uh, essentially how old the world is. Now, of course, Joseph, you may date him earlier than the second intermediate period uh, to maybe the middle kingdom, but uh, that's if, if you go with a, a longer chronology on that and uh, a longer period of judges. Um, but uh, Getting several millennia out of uh, expanding this. And now, of course, when it comes to the years, it doesn't tell us how many months old they were. So you you can you can uh, you you can accordion that out a little bit. Um, but going from uh, maybe there's. A couple hundred years, maybe uh, a few decades, that we can stretch the timeline out. Going from that to let's add tens of thousands of years doesn't make it consistent anymore because at that point you're coming to a point where you have to believe that the period of judges is more than a millennium long and that uh, Joseph may have been in Egypt at uh, the early, uh, uh, very early on in in the old kingdom, or perhaps in uh, the, the proto-dynastic period, um, Calcolithic age, uh, uh, which of course, at, at that point, things are getting a bit weird. But uh, we know that in Moses, we have references to bronze and iron, which means that when it comes to iron, iron was known in Egypt and was produced in Egypt from at least the Middle Bronze Age. Uh, but of course, it only became very widely used after the Bronze Age collapse, uh, but not as much in Egypt because Egypt still relied on bronze more than other powers in the region did. Uh, so... Uh, uh, at the latest, uh, oh, sorry, the earliest you can put the Exodus, in my opinion, would be the Middle Bronze Age, but that's really stretching it. Because from, we know how long the Exodus is, and we also know how long uh, the people lived in Egypt, and we know how long the generations are from Adam. So adding all those up, even with even if you go with a Septuagint to maybe get some larger numbers, it's not going to give you several extra millennia. Uh, but uh, let, let's continue on. Between the beginning of creation and the birth of Jesus, which seems a very unlikely coincidence. Yes, it is a very unlikely coincidence. And many young earth creationists will point that out to you and will say that it's a rough estimate for them. Uh, not a, an exact number. Although Usher came up with less than 100 generations from Adam to Jesus, many Old Testament verses indicate that there were actually... All right, one all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's analyze these, because this is, I think, an argument that is very shallow, because I, I looked at this earlier, and let's, let's look at, first of all, Exodus 20. So let me 
get my uh, Bible gateway. There we go. Exodus 20, since it's the earliest reference, and I think the one that, uh, judging by the analysis here, is the one that is precedent to the others. So Exodus 20, verse 6. All right, and let me transfer over. Uh, that's the other thing, and for some reason keep losing my images here. Maybe I've got too many windows open. There we go. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and let's see. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Uh, this is, by the way, why I am a, a little bit of an iconoclast, not a hard line iconoclast just a, a little bit you shall not bow down to them or worship them for i the lord your god am a jealous god punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments what does this mean does this mean you're punishing a thousand, uh, sorry, you are not punishing. Uh, you are showing love to a thousand previous generations for the actions of the, of the Israelites here. No, what it's saying is it, this is referring to generations generate to give birth to bring forth. It is referring to their descendants, a thousand generations, not to their ancestors to their descendants. Because otherwise, verse 5 doesn't make sense. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You have to understand the context determines the meaning of a thousand generations here. And the context clearly indicates that this is referring to their descendants. So let's look at the other verses. Let's, let's go down the list. Um, uh, Deuteronomy is the next one. Deuteronomy 5.10, then 7.9. And Deuteronomy... Deuteronomy... Uh, the, the second... The, the second reading of the law, Deuteronomy. Uh, oh, forgot. Seven. And let me just double check the reference. Oh, no, it's it's five and seven. I'll, I'll read seven first since I'm there. All right. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to the face of those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give you today. And I, I have a question then. Do these people... Is he telling them that their actions are affecting their ancestors? Because, of course, this is the second reading of a law, so it's obviously referring back to the first reading of a law. And we know in Exodus that this was referring to their descendants. So let's, let's do chapter 5. And what's the verse? Uh, let me cycle through all my tabs. I've got way too many open. 510. All right. Oh, I've got to cycle again. Accidentally overstepped my bounds. 510. Okay. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. So it's re restating the seven, com the, sorry, seven, the ten commandments. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does that mean? Their descendants, not their ancestors. Um, 
And now let's go to 1 Chronicles 16. First Chronicles 16. And the verse is verse 15. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. The, the covenant that we're talking about here, is this a covenant that goes back a thousand generations or is this a covenant that proceeds for a thousand generations and oh wait wait uh everlasting covenant hmm are we actually talking about literally a thousand generations here eh maybe that's uh, not actually saying literally a thousand generations but nevertheless an unfathomable number of descendants an unfathomable amount of descent uh, on so many generations down the line a thousand generations uh you know it's like when uh, jesus says that uh, you should forgive 70 times 70 so I, I think that's the type of implication that is being made here um but it's talking about that he will keep his covenant forever the promise he made for a thousand generations and who did they who did who did he make the promise to abraham Isaac, Jacob, Israel. He's not talking about Adam here. He's talking about the covenant he made with his chosen people. And remember, at the time that this is being written, I don't think that we can reasonably say that a thousand generations had passed at the time that this is being written here in Chronicles. So this is, in fact, talking about their descendants. And finally, Psalm 105, 8. All right, Psalm 105, verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Hmm. And again, context matters. You can't just state something and read it out of context and take it any way you want. Because, believe it or not, you can do that with any verse in the Bible. And you can make the Bible say whatever you want if you ignore the context. So, here we go. Thousand generations, even up to the time of King David. Uh... Mm, again, it's talking about their At descendants years, dis coming from the time of Abraham. Per generation, this would put the creation of Adam at least 40,000 years ago. And this is pretty interesting because what he's saying is that a generation has to be a specific period of time, 40 years here, which is, of course, contextually not what is being stated because... He's actually saying the children of those who hate me to the third and fourth generation in, in a contrasting statement. So, again, this is entirely ignoring the context of these passages. Young Earth Dogma says that the universe and the Earth are only 6,000 years And again, this is not a dogmatic statement. There's many different ideas uh, that Young Earth creationists have. Generally, it's somewhere from 6,000 or maybe less than 6,000 if you're an Anno Mundi person to uh, about 10,000 on, on the upper end. So that, that's generally the range of young earth creationism. You may find people that are maybe 11 or 12,000 people, but at that point, you, you stretch the chronology to a point where it doesn't really make sense anymore. But again, the chronology does refer to the ages of the individuals when they proceeded to have the next generation, which indicates that the time periods 
are consecutive and not uh, interspersed of with significant figures only being mentioned because otherwise you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have the time period being given for them uh, having a descendant and on the uh, on the thousand generations that's speaking about their descendants very clearly in the context years old However, the Bible clearly indicates that humanity has been commanded by God for at least 40,000 years. When forced to choose between their dogma and the Bible, young earth creationists reject the Bible. And again, that's incorrect. You're actually, Rich Deem, in this situation, the one who's choosing to read all these verses out of context in order to prove your point. Because in context, you very clearly see that this is not speaking about how many ancestors they had. Because otherwise, it wouldn't make sense that David is making a psalm saying a thousand generations, and then Moses is writing uh, a thousand generations, because there's several generations between Moses and David. So um, the, the math doesn't add up. If, if you do it that way either. So, yeah. So it's not talking about how long people were around. It's talking about the um, eternal length of his covenant. That's what, it's, that's what it's talking about. That's what God is saying. He's saying that his covenant will hold, that his love will hold for a thousand generations. And what you're saying is, is that he has loved a thousand generations in the past, but uh, we're, we're not sure whether his covenant is going to hold tomorrow. Because the statement used to indicate that his covenant is going to be held is what you're delegating to something that is occurring in the past and not something that is ongoing as is being implied by the verses. But of course, I, I'm not saying that you're saying that the covenant is temporary. What I am saying is that you're taking the verse and implying that it means the exact opposite of what it actually means. But anyway, uh, I think I'll stop here. This video has gone long enough. I've even had a significant period of time where it's doing some research on something that I um, probably I'm going to cut out in posts. So uh, thank you all for watching, and I will be seeing you all next time on Awiltos Over. And 